Hello everyone! We've done a whole series on how evolution works, and another on what the evidence for evolution is, along with numerous examples of evolution occurring in different lineages. Today though, I want to single out just my personal favorite examples of experiments involving evolution, including evidence for beneficial mutations, natural and sexual selection, and speciation. We have discussed some evolutionary experiments previously, such as the experimental speciation of Drosophila pseudo-obscura, so go check out our video, Splitting Kinds, if you want to know more about that. So let's jump right in. <laughs> I think it's only fair to start this discussion where Darwin himself started, with artificial selection. Darwin used the human-driven selection of cabbages, dogs, pigeons, and other organisms as an analogy for how natural selection operates. Darwin knew that everyone was already aware of breeding, so he used this process to help his readers make the short conceptual leap to natural selection. As it happens, artificial selection experiments are extremely useful in biology from agriculture to medicine. Who says evolution isn't useful? My favorite artificial selection experiment is the 2007 HIV-1 proviral DNA excision using an evolved recombinase. Researchers took an enzyme called CRE recombinase, which cuts out DNA between two identical sequences, and evolved it to recognize HIV sequences. The logic behind it is this. When viruses insert themselves into our genome, the DNA they splice in is flanked by sequences called long terminal repeats. Now, what if there were an enzyme that, rather than inserts, cuts out DNA flanked by identical sequences? Further, what if the flanking sequences identified by that enzyme were reasonably similar to the long terminal repeats of an HIV strain? As it happens, researchers identified such an enzyme, CRE recombinase in P1 bacteriophages. CRE recombinase excises DNA flanked by two 34 base pair sequences called LOXP. The HIV strain TZB0003 has long terminal repeats that are 50% identical to LOXP. It's the strain with long terminal repeats most similar to LOXP. Unfortunately, this strain only exists in 1% of HIV patients, but at least it can do some good. To understand the diagram that I'm showing here, look at the top left. LOXP is the original sequence that CRE recombinase can identify. LOX, LTR, is the long terminal repeat that exists in the HIV strain. Now, LOXP is too different from LOX, LTR for CRE recombinase to be used directly. So, researchers figured they could gradually evolve this enzyme to remove LOX, LTR sequences. To do that, Researchers split up the differences, which amount to mutations, between LOXP and LOXLTR into two sequences, LOXLTR1 and LOXLTR2. However, when researchers tried to use CRE recombinase on these sequences, the enzymes could not excise the DNA. So, researchers split the differences further. LOXLTR1 was split into LOXLTR1A, and LOXLTR1B, and LOXLTR2 was split into LOXLTR2A and LOXLTR2B. Fortunately, CRE recombinase could in fact recognize these sequences. These sequences served as the baseline for the experiment. Researchers then evolved these enzymes in E. coli, that is, through mutation and selection, to become ever more efficient at excising their respective sequences. Researchers selected the E. coli that were increasingly good at excising their respective sequences. Once the enzymes became sufficiently good at excising their respective sequences, they became usable on LOXLTR1 and LOXLTR2. Researchers then repeated the process with LOXLTR1 and LOXLTR2, and once the E. coli were sufficiently good at that, they could be used on the original LOXLTR sequence. Thus, Researchers evolved an enzyme that could not recognize a particular sequence into one that could. 
Another experiment involving artificial selection concerns Saccharomyces cerevisiae, also known as baker's yeast. Baker's yeast is unicellular, but can, under certain conditions, form colonies or biofilms of genetically disparate cells. This is called flock-type aggregation, and occurs because of glycoproteins in the yeast's cell wall. While this is interesting, it's not relevant to the origin of complex multicellularity, as all complex multicellular organisms have clonal cells. Otherwise, an organism composed of genetically different cells would leave it susceptible to cheating, a phenomenon which has been observed in the social amoeba Dictyostelium discoideum. There have been numerous experiments involving baker's yeast and multicellularity. My favorite is the 2012 Experimental Evolution of Multicellularity. In this experiment, researchers took two separate colonies of unicellular baker's yeast and subjected them to separation by gravity. The cells that settled on the bottom the quickest were removed and grown in a new culture. The process was repeated. After a number of iterations of this experiment, the yeast cells became faster at settling on the bottom. The reason is that the yeast cells started forming clonal, multicellular phenotypes called snowflakes. Unlike the aggregations, yeast cells were undergoing mitosis to form identical cells. The researchers confirmed this by staining the yeast bud scars, so they were not colonies, but actual multicellular organisms. Further, the researchers confirmed that the snowflake phenotypes were stable, even after the snowflake populations were transferred to an environment in which selection did not occur, unicellular forms never invaded. To top it all off, researchers observed division of labor in the snowflakes, a hallmark of complex multicellularity. The snowflake propagules, their cells that would go on to form their own colonies, formed by budding off from the parent snowflake. This occurred by the parent inducing apoptosis in certain cells so that small branches of the parent could separate. In total, researchers observed both the evolution of multicellularity and the division of labor in formerly unicellular yeast. Remember that researchers have no control over which mutations occur, but the yeast experiment demonstrates that beneficial mutations can and do happen. Now, let's turn to some experiments that demonstrate natural selection. Unarguably, the most famous observed example of natural selection happened in the peppered moth Biston bacillaria, which we covered in our video Common Ancestry. Antibiotic resistance is a trait that can rapidly evolve in bacterial populations. For example, there is a 2016 video by Science News, linked in the description, that shows E. coli adapting over the course of 11 days to increasingly concentrated antibiotics. Another bacterium, Pseudomonas fluorescens, is popular because it easily develops mutations that change its cell morphology, and these mutations can be correlated with particular environments and selective pressures. For example, the 2013 paper Adaptive Divergence in Experimental Populations of Pseudomonas fluorescens, Insight into the Niche Specialist Fuzzy Spreader Compels Revision of the Model Pseudomonas Radiation, discusses the exact mutations involved in the origination of the fuzzy pseudomonas morphotype. The fuzzy morph is generated by simple point mutations in a gene called FUZY that modifies cell surface lipopolysaccharides. Ironically, the FUZ genes are required for the wrinkly morph, but knockout mutations in the FUZY gene generates the fuzzy morph. Because of this knockout, the fuzzy morph doesn't form a biofilm on top of the nutrient broth like the wrinkly morph. Instead, the fuzzy morph forms transient rafts atop the broth that, once they become too heavy, sink to the bottom of the broth. One might respond to this by saying, well, that's just a loss of information. While a gene is indeed knocked out, resistance to the bacteriophage, SBW2552, is conferred by this mutation and a novel phenotype arises as a result of this mutation. So you have at least two gains as a result of a loss. But there is a further twist to the story. The original smooth morph diversifies into two morphs due to mutational differences, and the wrinkly morph comes to predominate. Then, natural selection by bacteriophages, such as the aforementioned one, drives an increase in the proportion of fuzzy morphs since they have resistance to the bacteriophage, whereas the wrinkly morph doesn't. As the proportion of fuzzy morphs increases, the population of bacteriophages decline, and as the pressure selecting against wrinkly morphs declines, wrinkly morphs resurge. This, 
of course, forces fuzzy morphs into decline, allowing bacteriophages to increase in turn. There is a constant evolutionary arms race between the wrinkly and fuzzy morphs. Researchers then demonstrated that this in fact happens, and happens easily. Fuzzy morphs can be derived from wrinkly morphs by two simple mutations. One mutation to revert a wrinkly morph to a smooth morph, and then another mutation to change a smooth morph to a fuzzy morph. Out of 49 wrinkly populations, 23 populations, that's 47%, mutated into fuzzy morphs. The genome of P. fluorescens is 6,722,539 base pairs long, so a naive calculation of the probability of these mutations would be 1 in 6,722,539 squared, or about 1 in 4.5 times 10 to the power of 13. That means math proves these mutations are virtually impossible, right? Well, obviously not. The problem isn't the mutations actually occurring, the problem is naive creationist math. I would describe the 2019 experiment by Heron et al. in which they evolved unicellular chlamydomonas into clonal multicellular chlamydomonas in response to predation, but we already did that in misunderstanding multicellularity. Instead, we're going to turn your attention to an experiment that demonstrated natural selection occurred in the past. The 2017 paper, Taxon Restricted Genes at the Origin of a Novel Trait Allowing Access to a New Environment. The water strider genus Ragavalia experienced a duplication of the gene Mother of Geisha, resulting in the gene Geisha that causes the formation of novel propeller fans on the insect's legs. Unlike other closely related members of the same family, such as Stradulavalia, Ragavalia can move on fast moving water thanks to these propeller fans. And researchers showed that the fans still provided a movement boost even when reduced, indicating that the fans were adaptively beneficial at all stages of their evolution. As you can see, natural selection obviously happens. But what about sexual selection? One of the most famous sexual selection experiments involved the brightly colored guppy Poecilia reticulata, recorded in the 1980 Natural Selection on Color Patterns in Poecilia reticulata. Researchers constructed ten pawns. Four had guppies and the relatively innocuous killifish, Rivulus hartii, and six had guppies with the predatory pike cichlid, Crinocicla alta. In the guppy killifish pawns, the number and size of blue and iridescent spots on the guppies rapidly increased. Conversely, in the guppy pike pawns, the number and size of the spots rapidly decreased. The colorful spots were disadvantageous in environments with predators, but were preferentially favored by the guppies themselves in the predator-less environments. Thus, we can see a trade-off between sexual and natural selection. Another experiment in sexual selection, researchers tested the nematode Canorhabditis elegans by growing them in an environment with the bacteria Serratia marcescens. Documented in the 2011 paper, Running with the Red Queen, host parasite coevolution selects for biparental sex. C. elegans can reproduce either asexually or sexually. In the control, representing normal conditions, C. elegans reproduces sexually only about 20% of the time. The researchers then prepared two treatments, evolution and coevolution. The evolution treatment involved exposing C. elegans to a single strain of S. marcescens, while the coevolution treatment involved exposing C. elegans to strains of S. marcescens continually selected for pathogenicity. In the evolution treatment, sexual reproduction became widespread, about 70% at first, but declined likely as C. elegans attained immunity. On the other hand, in the coevolution treatment, sexual reproduction rose to occurring over 80% of the time, and all the obligately asexual C. elegans went extinct. The reason is that during sexual reproduction, adaptive variations can arise and be spread through the population more easily than during asexual reproduction. The researchers conclude, quote, taken together, the results demonstrate that sex can facilitate adaptation to novel environments, but the long-term maintenance of sex requires that the novelty does not wear off, close quote. Next, we're going to discuss a speciation experiment. Similar to the Drosophila pseudo-obscura experiment mentioned at the beginning, the 2005 paper, Divergent Selection and the Evolution of Signal Traits and Mating Preferences, describes an experiment with D. serrata, where different populations were raised on different foods. 
The original population was reared with yeast food, and the two experimental populations were reared on rice and corn food, respectively. D. serrata individuals identify mates using contact pheromones, which are composed of non-volatile cuticular hydrocarbons. The expression of these hydrocarbons is dependent on the amino acids present in the diet, which probably contributed to differential sexual selection between the original and experimental populations. In both of the experimental populations, a combination of hydrocarbons that was considered unattractive in the original became attractive. This selective divergence in mating preferences is an example of a prezygotic barrier, that is, a barrier to mating between two individuals. Prezygotic barriers are, in a sense, the first step to speciation, in this experiment, because two populations have different mating preferences, they are no longer going to mate with each other, leading to increasing genetic divergence. Indeed, that's exactly what happened here. Finally, we're going to cover an experiment that demonstrates why phylogenetics is reliable and not just drawing lines on a page. The 1992 paper, Experimental Phylogenetics, Generation of a Known Phylogeny, describes how researchers took a clonal population of T7 bacteriophages, node W, and split it. The two populations, leading to nodes E and F, were allowed to undergo multiple generations while in the presence of a mutagen. After an equal length of time, the two populations were manually split again, leading to nodes A, B, C, and D, and allowed to continue reproducing in the presence of the mutagen. After another equal length of time, the four populations were split a final time and allowed to propagate. A separate group of researchers sequenced the endonucleases of each population, and the sequences were plugged into five different phylogeny programs. All five phylogeny programs returned the correct ancestor-descendant relationships, confirming that phylogenies do represent reality. In total, there are very, very many experiments demonstrating different aspects of evolution. This is by no means an exhaustive list of evolution experiments. Many more can be found in the 2012 paper, Experimental Evolution, linked below. Some might ask at this point, though the mechanisms demonstrated in these experiments do indeed happen, can we be sure that these mechanisms are responsible for generating biodiversity over long periods? Yes. In our video, Splitting Kinds, we discussed how natural selection and speciation can be observed in the fossil record. Organisms adapt to their environment and evolve over generations, in some cases gradually diverging towards separate forms. Microevolution seamlessly, naturally, culminates in macroevolution. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.